Next up, we have Stephen Zhang from the Anderman Lab at Harvard Medical School. And he's gonna talk about hypothalamic dopamine neurons, uh, control the motivation to mate via persistent cyclic AMP to PKA signaling. Thank you very much for the introduction. And today I want to talk to you about how to make stable functional states in the brain. Many of such brain states such as arousal state, motivational state, behavior state are important organizing variables that coordinate different sets of actions towards common goals. And perhaps because of the role as organizing variables, these states are often stable, but they can be updated, special conditions are met. How do you make such stable state? How do you update them? These are the questions I want to address today with our system of male mating drive. Before I start, I want to first thank Mark and his vision for having me do this extremely different project in his lab. I want to thank everybody uh, who have directly contributed to the project, especially Andrew and Adriana. I hope you all went to Andrew's poster yesterday. I want to thank everybody else who have helped out with experiments in other forms, especially our collaborators from Monago Lab, whose really cool tools I hope I get to show off at the end. Let's start with behavior first principle. The behavior phenomenon I want to talk about today is called sexual priming. It turns out that if you pair the same male mouse with two different receptive females, one after the other, the male's mating behavior will be much more pronounced towards the second female than the first, as if interacting with one female primes the male's mating drive to interact with the second. The interesting thing about priming is it's persistent. It turns out that you can wait as long as 30 minutes between these two females without decreasing the efficacy of priming. You can see the phenomenon in two different ways. Uh, one, if you look at the latency of the male mounting behavior, just how fast he mounts across different waiting periods between the first and second females, what you see here is that at the baseline, in our hand, the mounting latency is about five minutes. After priming, we can get it dropped down to about one to two minutes, which can last for, as, you can assay this as late as 30 minutes after the first female. And then it gradually recovers back to baseline again in about two hours. If you look at the sniffing behavior for the male, apologies for the long y-axis, but it's measuring the sniffing behavior of the male, then you see pretty much the same thing, that after priming, the male spend more time sniffing and it gradually recovers best. Sexual priming is therefore a phenomenon of triggered by interaction with females and it will last for tens of minutes before it goes back. How do we study this? In my PhD, I study how genes, neuron circuits control the motivation to mate in the fly, and there we'll find out such important contributors. And in the center of the fly mating drive system is dopamine. And this is not a coincidence because we know that in male rats, if you infuse dopamine agonists into this area, medial preoptic area of MPOA, you can dramatically increase the mating behavior of the rats. In humans, if you take drugs that boost or decrease the dopamine signaling, you often come with side effects of boost or decrease libido. So obviously we're talking about exogenous dopamine agonists here. So the first thing we want to do is to figure out how dopamine might be released endogenously in the MPOA during mating behaviors. To do that, we're going to use the dopamine sensor DLI 1.1 together with fiber photometry, a setup many of you are familiar with, so I'm not going to go too much into detail about that. I want to show you dopamine release when the male is about to interact with the female, namely sniffing. I'm going to show the data using the form of heat map from blue to red. Each row here is a sniff, the sniffs are along the dotted line. Before we did the experiment, what we thought was going to happen is that dopamine will get released after the male sniffing the female. But if you look at the data, if anything, it's the opposite. It looks like dopamine level seems to have dropped when the male sniffs. So it turns out that if you average all the trials of all the males, what you actually see is that as the male is approaching the female, there is a ramping up of dopamine activity that drops when the male starts sniffing. There's a ramp and drop activity pattern that may look familiar to you as if the animal is doing a navigational test. However, we think that here, the source of dopamine is likely different because if you do the same experiment, but now in a different brain area, nucleus accumbens, there you see that dopamine is being released after the male starts sniffing, not before. So I'm going to skip ahead and tell you that we think in the MPOA, the source of dopamine is local, coming from these two dopamine nuclei and two eventual paraventricular nucleus, AVPV, and preoptic paraventricular nucleus, PVPO. These dopamine neurons, they project the axons laterally into the MPOA, and if you silence these neurons, you get males that are not interested in either sniffing or mounting. Now, dopamine is released during male-female social interactions. Male-female social interactions will prime the male's mating drive. You imply that potentially dopamine is the molecule that's doing the priming. 
To test the hypothesis, we optogenetically stimulated dopamine axons in the MPOA briefly. Then we turned off the stimulation, waited some variable period of time from zero to two hours, just like in the natural priming assay. And then we tested male's mating behavior afterwards. So there's no first female here. In this experiment, if you look at the latency of male mounting behavior on the y-axis across different waiting periods, you see once again that the baseline the mounting latency is about five minutes, but you can get it to drop down to one to two minutes for as long as 30 minutes after the initial stimulation had been turned off and it gradually recovers back again in one to two hours. If you look at the sniffing behavior of the male, you see very much the same thing. So these data give me the first conclusion, which is that dopamine release in the MPOA during male-female social interactions is sufficient to prime male mating drive. Okay, how does it work? How does dopamine release 10 minutes ago affect male behavior 10 minutes later? So to do that, we decided to look into the signal transduction of dopamine. As many of you know, dopamine signals through D1, D2 type receptors that will work to increase or decrease cyclic AMD, which will then activate PKA, and from there the possibility is endless. So to begin to look for evidence of priming or persistence, really, we decided to look as early as cyclic AMP using these following experiments. Here, we express crimson and redshifted opsin in AVPVPVPO neurons so that we can now stimulate their axons in the MPOA. Also in the MPOA, we express CADIS, a cyclic AMP sensor. So this setup allows us to use the same fiber to stimulate dopamine axons and record what's going on with cyclic AMP. I'm going to show you the data here on the bottom left plotting CADIS fluorescence over time. Unsurprisingly, when you turn on the light, you see cyclic AMP being produced, and when you turn off the light, it goes away. We confirm that this production of cyclic AMP is due to D1 receptors. No surprise there. What's interesting here, though, is the fact that at the end of each stimulation, there's some residual cyclic AMP. The point about having residual cyclic AMP is that if you do the stimulation again, 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 then the cyclic AMP residual level can build up to a much greater level than what individual trial can produce. Case in point, if I reanalyze this data on the bottom left, but now if I group the trials five by five, what you see here in the first five trials, not a lot of cycling MP being produced or accumulated. But as you go on trials more and more, you see that now the accumulation started kicking, producing cycling MP to a much greater degree than the measly little bump that each individual trial can produce. After 40 trials, you can in fact turn off the stimulation, go get a cup of coffee, come back, and cyclic AMP is still there. So what we have is a graded and persistent cyclic AMP signaling. Even though cyclic AMP is persistent, we don't think dopamine is, because if we do exactly the same experiment, but now monitoring dopamine release using DLI 1.1 as opposed to cyclic AMP, we see that after stimulation, dopamine goes up, dopamine goes down, no evidence for persistence. Now, let me just put the recordings and behavior experiments a little bit to build you a model. During social investigations, a male will sniff females quite a bit. Around each sniff, there's a ramping and dropping of dopamine activity or dopamine molecules in the MPOA. Dopamine can come and go. Its influence is here to stay because downstream of dopamine, there's accumulation of its signal starting in the level of the cyclic AMP that's being accumulated or some from trial to trial. We think it is when this accumulation reaching some kind of threshold, that is when the male decide when to mount. So in our priming experiment, optogenetic or natural priming experiments, what we're really doing is bringing this accumulation to a near threshold level. So the whole thing behaves like hair trigger. The animal only needs one sniff before he decides to mount. And that's why we get a much shorter mounting latency. For the last five minutes of my talk, I want to focus on the biochemistry of persistent cyclic AMP signal, asking questions yeah, such as, how long does the persistence last? And to do that, we need to read to our experiment because we're potentially looking at cyclic AMP persistent on the level of tens of minutes up to hours. And photometry is really not a good technique for that. So we're going to switch our recording method to two photon microscopy looking at MPOA neurons. In particular, what we're going to do what is called two photon fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy or two photon flim, which uses the lifetime of the fluorophore instead of intensity, which allows us to look at cyclic EMP concentration or PK activity without the interference of bleaching. So here's the experiment. We're once again going to use crimson to stimulate AVPVPVPO dopamine neurons axons in the MPOA. 
Also in the MPOA, we're going to use a PKA sensor called Flame A cars developed by Yao Chen and Bernardo, and you heard Bernardo talking about it yesterday. So this setup allows us to use the same green lens to optogenetically stimulate dopamine axons, as well as record what's going on to PKA activity. This is a typical field of view that many of you are familiar with, looking at individual uh, MPOA cells through the green lens. But the field of view we're interested in is the flame field of view, as I shown here. So in the flint field of view, you now can able to see the color of individual pixels to show you the PKA activity. For example, around this cell here, you can see that 30 minutes after the optical stimulation of dopamine, now the surrounding pixels become much more bluer, meaning that now they have much higher PKA activity. And this PKA activity goes away over about two hours. So if I plot you all the cells from all the field of view from all the mice, here what I'm showing you is on the top right, where you see that if I plot flame activity over time after each stimulation, you see that for 30 minutes after stimulation, you can still record uh, quite high PK activity that gradually decays away over the course of about one to two hours. This decay time course matches the behavior decay of priming that I have shown you very early on in the priming assay. So what we have is a correlation between biochemical decay of PKA activity and the motivational decay measured by behavior assays. To establish causal relation between these two things, we're going to use some new tools. The first new tool I'm going to talk to you about is called BIPAC. It's the optogenetic adenocyclase allows us to use light to make cyclic AMP, pretty much skip the entirety of dopamine signaling cas cascade. So if we express BIPAC, together with cyclic MP sensor CADIS in the MPOA, and we use CADIS fluorescence to tell how much, MPOA, how much cyclic MP is being produced, then we can see the following result, which is that every time you give a BiPAC pulse of activity, you see a step-like activity, a step-like increase in cyclic MP concentration that is persistent over the course of about 10 minutes. Again, it's persistent. If you do the same experiment, but now in nucleus accumbens, you see a very different picture. Now cyclic AMP is being degraded after each stimulation. So what you're really looking at here are two different modes of cyclic AMP signaling, the persistent mode in the MPOA and the episodic mode in the nucleus accumbens. The fact that we can either bring in a bacterial adenocyclase and we can induce, a type, induce um, uh, cyclic AMP persistence right away, that means that the source of cycling MP doesn't really matter for its persistence. It can come from literally anywhere. It just this MPO, MPOA neurons are not really bothering to clear away its own cyclic AMP. That's something we can help with by using a phosphodiesterase, which is an enzyme that's job is to clear cyclic AMP. So we have engineered this constitutive PDE, PDE43, that's always chewing away cyclic AMP in the MPOA. Now, if we're introducing this together with BIPAC and CADIS in the MPOA, now we have transformed the signaling mode from a persistent mode into a episodic mode. We can use this tool for behavior assays as well. I'm gonna skip ahead and one last time I tell you that downstream doping neurons, we think lies in the neurons express this sexual dimorphic gene called estrogen receptor neurons. Estrogen receptor neurons in the MPOA, at least a subpopulation of them, we think interpret dopamine signal and it's being involved in behavior. So in the last two minutes, minute, Stephen. Yep, that's two minutes, I'm gonna introduce that. Um, so we can use this in, in a couple of different ways. One, we can express BIPAC in the ESL1 neurons and that allows us to use optogenetically pre-elevate cyclic AMP in this neuron. So skipping all the dopamine manipulation that could be doing, we just increase cyclic AMP. And we can turn off the stimulation, wait for a little bit, and then assay the male's mating behavior. If we do that and look at the sniffing behavior of the male, or if we look at the mounting behavior of the male, we see that now the male sniff more and mount more quickly, meaning that it's now being primed. We can do the flip side of the experiment at all with the phosphodiesterase PD43 that we have engineered to be always active. If we express this in ERSL1 neurons and do the two female priming as they introduced in the very beginning where the male's motivation to mate with second animals is really higher. Now, if we constantly just chew away cyclic AMP in the ERSL1 neurons if, and we look at the sniffing behavior of the male or the mounting behavior of the male, we see no evidence of priming. So put things together a little bit. We think that dopamine is being released during each sniff. 
But dopamine is a molecule that's being used to update motivational state of the animal. The actual mating drive state of the male is sustained by a persistent cyclic EMP PTA signaling, and it's a time course of this sustained or persistent biochemical signal that's dictating the time course of a motivation of the male. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank the organizers for having me give a talk, and I'm happy to take questions. Great job, Stephen. We have plenty of time for questions. Shelly? Uh, sorry, one was in the, oh, yes. A uh, question from Lauren. Um, cyclic AMP is a promiscuous effector and has many functions in the cell. Uh, when doing these optogenetic manipulations, are you manipulating cyclic AMP everywhere in the cell? Yes, you, if we're talking about subcellular localizations, we none of our tools actually confer any specificity in that regard. The cyclic AMP we think are going to be increased everywhere, wherever the tool is being developed. There are ways to name to put it in more interesting places, such as cilia that has been recently been developed, but we haven't started using that yet. But that could be a, a way to go about doing it. All right. If anyone wants to. Um... Put any I, questions in the I guess I have a I have a question. Um, I mean, this is very provocative because you know you're taking the work from the biochemical computation and the fly as it relates to behavior, and you're bringing it to um, to us in some ways through the mice. So my question was, I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to transmit this information to the circuits that are initiating a mount or initiating a SNP. So then you still are going to need spike-based signal propagation from the MPOA into those action-generating circuits, right? Yes. Um, and what I don't see here is a real clear connection between the sustained PK signal, the cyclic AMP pathway, and the electrical signals that are going to get you from the MPOA to those action-generating circuits. Do you have anything to reflect on there? Sure. So the way I think about it is that the goal of the cyclic AMP is not to make the neuron fire. Because if, if all you do is to make the neuron fire and the neuron downstream neuron firing will means the animals will mount, means that the male, once being primed, will just go around and mount about anything he sees, which is not what you want. What you do want is to facilitate the transformation of the sensory information that male could be coming, getting in the MPOA, and in turn makes it now the downstream neurons, such as ERS1 neurons, more or less able to fire to the same sensory information. So now, why does persistence in, why does persistence of cyclic EMP play an important role in that case? What that means is that the first time when you sniff the female that you see for the first time, you, you're not quite sure about the sensory identity of your sniffing target. Therefore, your, mount, your mounting probability shouldn't be as high as if you have sniffed 10 times later. So the way you can do then is therefore you can adjust the, the using a gradient of cyclic EMP to adjust the probability of mounting per sniff, such that in a courage, in recurrent uh, investigation of your target, really figure out everything about the, the, uh, the animal you're sniffing before you try, before the neurons start firing, before you commit to an action. That's what I think the advantage of the system is. Yeah. I mean, you could easily solve that problem with, with a recurrent neural network, right? So why do you think in some cases you'd have biochemical, like these chemical pathways holding on to these traces, whereas in other conditions, you might get a recurrent neural network just holding on to this information over time with spikes. So my understanding of the recurrent network in theoretical work and, and so on, in, and some experimental work more recently, is usually on this time scale of seconds. You know, I've, you know, 10 seconds will be a very long recurrent network as far as I can know. Um, so it, it is possible, though I don't see a lot of very good evidence that you can use this recurrent network to mediate persistence or accumulation of evidence you know, over very, very long time scale, we're talking about minutes. You know, you can imagine in the wild, a mouse sniff another mouse and then a target disappears. Then the male need to, you know, persist in chasing away, chasing after that one. So that could take a while. And the second reason why biochemical accumulation information might be a good candidate here is the fact that then you can free up the rest of your network to do whatever other computation you want to do. You're really storing information in an example of key neurons using the analog system of cyclic EMP and PKA activity. That's how I would, that's how I would think that would be advantage. Yeah. Any other questions, Shelley? No more questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephen Zhang. That was great.